So uh, welcome everyone uh, to a new session of our Spring Phenomenology, Phenomenology Seminars. Uh, We're very happy to introduce our first speaker of today, who is Andres Riostascon, Riostascon, and he's going to tell us about computational mirror symmetry. Please go ahead. Okay, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present here. So today I'll be talking about computational mirror symmetry. And the takeaway for this talk will be that we've made significant advancements in computing GoPuff with 10 and GoPuff with more buffer invariants. This allows us to study previously inaccessible parts of the landscape with a large number of moduli. There's a wide range of, you know, of interesting applications for our tools, and we're beginning to explore them. This is work done in collaboration with Mehmet Demirtes, Mankei Kim, uh, my advisor, Liam McAllister, and Jakob Moritz. Here's an outline for my talk. I'll give some motivation and background. I'll describe our advancements. I'll show some insights and applications for our tools, and I'll conclude. So let's start at the beginning. So as all of you know, mirror symmetry is quite a profound duality. It tells us that if we take type 2 and 2B string theory and compactify them on mirror manifolds, we end up getting the same physics in the for the effective theory. And this also tells us that there's a relation between the Keller modular space of one clavia with the complex structure modular space of the mirror clavia. The reason why this is important is that there are some computations that can be done much more recently from a dual computation on the mirror clavia. A very famous example of this was from Candelas and company, where they were able to compute the number of rational curves in the quantity hyperservice in P4, which is a known hard problem in our algebraic geometry. Today I'll be talking about close about related topological invariants called Gumar of Witten and Gopa Gumar Waffa invariants. I'll only be talking about Gino zero, even if I don't explicitly say that. And the reason why I want to compute these invariants is that they give us very powerful information about the geometry. Uh, with type 2B compacted for an acla BOX. And let's look at the complex structure modular space. This is an H2 one dimensional spatial Keller manifold. And it has a geometric interpretation in terms of periods of the three form of the Calabiao over a symplectic basis of the middle homology or cohomology. And here, this period vector is giving us projective, projective coordinates of the modular space and the reverse of the potential of the spatial geometry. And crucially, on this side, there are no quantum corrections. And now let's look at the mirror. We'll get type 2A compactified of the mirror clavia x tilde. We'll be looking at the Keller moduli space, which is again a special Keller manifold of the same dimension. And we can construct an analogous vector. We know the TSI are coordinates in the Keller moduli space, and if it's again the potential of the spatial geometry. But in this case, there are alpha prime corrections. So what we'll do is that we will compute the period vector on this left side. We'll match it with the period vector on the right. On the right side, we'll be doing all of this in the large complex structure or large large volume regimes, and we'll learn from the quantum corrections to this right side. So let's go through this in a bit more detail. Uh, so also, no claim Tyson and Yao device an algorithmic procedure to do this for Calabria hypersurface in toric varieties. So we'll be recalling some of the process here. What we do is that we start with a dual pair of 4D reflexive polytopes. And we consider a Kaleo via our hypersurface, F equals zero. Uh, this is the, the anti-canonical hypersurface in the, toric, in the properly desingularized toric variety. Uh, so initially, what we'll have is that we'll have uh, H21 plus, H2 plus four coefficients in this F polynomial. But there are actually some redundancies. So we'll actually use the linear relations, uh, integral generators, generators of the linear relations of delta to, to construct gauge invariant coordinates. So then now we only have H to one of them. And if you notice here, we're already using mirror symmetry via Batyov's construction. And now the trick is to work in the large complex structure limit LCS. Uh, and construct a cycle in the middle homology, and we define a corresponding fundamental period as follows. And the, the good thing here is that 
from the toric geometry will actually be able to extend it into a computation on the algebraic torus of the ambient variety. So we can actually do this integral explicitly and completely analytically. So the really toric, ge toric geometry is funny. It's what is enabling us to compute this period back, this fundamental period, because this uh, this integral linear relations are actually going to give us an integral basis for the period vector, and so that we can actually compute uh, this fundamental period. So after we do some work, we end up with the following expression for the fundamental period. We get that it's a sum of C functions with products of our psi coordinates. And the, fun the sum is over curves in the Morricone of X tilde. And crucially, uh, these C functions vanish for non-effective curves. So we can actually use the Morricone of the, of the ambient toric variety, which contains the Morricone of the Calabria since the actual Morricone of the Calabria is in general pretty hard to compute. And a uh, convenient thing here is that the periods of the Calabria will satisfy a system of differential equations called the picard fuchs equations. So what I'll see is we can actually write the other periods just by taking derivatives of this fundamental period. What we do is that we introduce a parameter rho into this fundamental period, and then we take derivatives of rho and then setting rho to zero to get new the periods omega a. This is actually going to give us uh, coordinates in the complex structure modular space of x uh, at, LC, at LCS. And we can actually compute the rest of the period vector by taking further derivatives. So now if we match to the mirror side, these omega a's are matched with the Keller coordinates ta. So we'll be able to write the ta's in terms of logs of the size and so plus some uh, polynomials alpha, which basically look very similar to the fundamental periods, except that we take derivatives of this C function here, the one said root equals to zero. And while we're here, let's also define this beta polynomials, where instead of taking one, one derivative, we take two derivatives. We'll see why in a second. Once we match the rest of the, of the entries in the period vector, we actually get a quantum correct the derivative of the prepotential on the Keller side, we find that it, we have find this expression over here where the red values are just the political quantities of X tilde. Here, kappa are, are just intersection numbers. These are matrix that depends on intersection numbers. And this is from the second chair class. And this first part is just a perturbative result that we didn't need mirror symmetry to compute. Whereas this other part comes from non-perturbative corrections to the sigma model, uh, which are, I mean, it's, it's what we use mirror symmetry for. Well, right now, we're, they're in terms of the psi coordinates. But then the idea is to rewrite this later part in terms of sums of exponentials of the t's or dialogues of exponentials of the t's. And once we write this in, in this kind of series, we'll see that the coefficients uh, will give us the Gumov-Witten or kopa kumar invariance of the corresponding curves in the MOVIC. So let's talk briefly about uh, GW and GV invariance. So first of all, both GW and GV invariance can only be non-zero for effective curves. So this is the kind of picture you, you should have in mind. The blue region is the Morricon. All the, of the black dots are effective curves. And only some of them have non-zero GV invariants. I'll talk more about the structure later on. Uh, so GW invariants are in general rational and they count number of the number of maps from P1 to a curve class, whereas GV invariants are always integer and they are BPS indices. They give us the difference between vector and hypermultiplets. So we'll actually be focusing on GV invariants for the rest of the talk since they have a, this nice integrality condition and they have a more physical interpretation. Another nice thing, nice thing is that if during the computation you use some, one, some wrong intersection numbers, some inconsistent truncation, or, some, or you miss some effective curve, you end up getting some seemingly non-integral GV invariance. So every time you end up with some, some non-integer answer, you know for sure that you um, that you made some mistake somewhere along the computation. 
So this is actually very, very robust against computational mistakes. Okay, so now let's move it. Let's move on to our describing our advances. Advances, and for context, let's talk about the tools that are already exist to compute, to compute GPU invariants. So, claim wrote a, an influential Mathematica package called Instanton around 1996, and Crowdsource made some improvements to it later. To our knowledge, these are the only packages available to do this computation. Well, publicly at least. And these are in fact still being used by recent papers. Here are a couple of nice uh, recent papers. And it, so even though Instanton is a pretty good package, it has a variety of shortcomings. First of all, it is limited to simplicial morricons. It can't compute GV invariance to a very high degree. And it can't study LBRs with a large number of moduli. And unfortunately, the vast majority of the Calabiaos are excluded by these conditions. So really need to do something to explore the, the landscape. So what we did is that we extended the HKTY procedure and we wrote new code that's all, all of these issues. So let's go through each of them. Uh, so first of all, the truncation scheme in Instanton relies on the Morricones, assuming and uh, assuming the Morricones being simplicial. The reason why of this is that if a Morricon is simplicial, uh, you can write a curve as a sum of the extremal generators, which we can uh, just assume to be the generators of the first orthant. And then under this assumption, we can define the degree of, of a curve to be just the sum of the coefficients. And so you do this so that you can specify a maximum coefficient and, and specify like a, a consistent trans, truncation of the series. The problem with this is that the overwhelming majority of KBO manifolds have non simplicial moricons. And a possible workaround for this is to construct a smooth uh, cone that contains the morricon. But this actually becomes really difficult to do and very inefficient due to this smoothness condition. Uh, because if you end up finding a smooth uh, containing con a large number of moduli, it actually is so much larger that you're not going to be able to compute any GP invariance for the real Morica. So what we did is that we devised a new truncation scheme that is more appropriate for non simplicial cones. So what we did is that, is, is that we pick a point in the Kähler cone, and then we define the degree of a curve to be just the dot product with this vector. So uh, since, it, since the point P is in the Keller cone, uh, the degrees for are, are strictly positive for non-zero effective curves. And now we can th think of the truncation as being given by a hyperplane that is defined by this P vector as in this figure on the right. This is this can be done even for a large number of modular and again for non simplicial morricons, so it's it's quite general. Now, now let's talk about computing high degree GV invariance. So what we did is that we completely uh, got rid, so we moved away from mathematics, we wrote all of our code in C, and we made everything much more efficient. So it scales much, much better with degree. And as a quick comparison, let's look at, a high, at the hypersurface in P11169, which has two moduli. So here in blue are the dots, are the GV invariants that you can compute with the original instanton package. In orange, the ones you, the extra ones you can compute with uh, Kurtz's improvements. And then in green, are the ones we can compute with our code. So we can really get to like really define them really deep in the Morricon with the GV invariants are astronomically large. And keep in mind that for this plot, I used, uh, we used the same amount of time for each of the computations. And here you can really see that our code increases a lot uh, slower, there, like, uh, it scales much better with the degree of the, of the the GV invariants. But now, let's. What if we want to compute G 
GV invariants at large number of modules like this. For, this is the most interesting of our improvements. So let's talk about that. Uh, so a crucial ingredient is our CY tools package, which allows us to compute, to study any toric hypersurface in, in the Kurtz's Karak database. The reason why this is important is because we need to compute intersection numbers and more recounts a large number of moduli. And we can do all of this with this package. We'll actually be releasing version 1.0 very soon. And so uh, to build GP variants at very large for number is a hard task, well, obviously. So we need to come, we can also with some tricks that we can use to our advantage. One very important insight is that uh, if you want to compute the GV invariant of a particular curve, let's say this one, you only need information about curves in its past light cone. So what you do is you take the negative of the Mori cone, you put it over here, and then you only need to consider curves in this intersection region. And that way you can compute uh, the, the GV invariant of this curve. And at large H11, this effect, it's, it really gets you much, much farther to what you can compute. A special case of this happens when the curve that you're interested in happen, uh, happens to lie on a face of the Morricone, because in that case, you only need to consider curves on that face of the Morricone. And a nice thing is that if you are computing GV invariance on an n-dimensional face, it is roughly as difficult as computing GV invariance for uh, Calabia with n moduli. So it gets much, much, much easier. Let's show an example of this. So let's look now at the mirror of the hypersurface in P1169 that we just looked at. And, and let's look at a two phase of the Morica. So here in this plot, this blue shaded region is a two phase of the Morica, and the black dots are non zero GV invariants. It's as, and as you can see, we computed all the way up to degree 100. So we can still see like really gigantic GV invariants. And, like interesting things happening. And keep in mind that this is at 272 moduli. This is, this is something that was completely impossible to do before. But also I don't want you to get the impression that we can only compute GV invariance for uh, low dimensional phases at large uh, number of moduli. We can still do the computation for the full dimensional cone and we can compute GV invariance for or there are hundreds of thousands or even millions of curves. The thing is that the thing is that the majority of those are gonna be zero because as I'll mention later, uh, GV invariants get exponentially sparse with increasing uh, number of modules. But what I want you to take away from this is that our tools are not just incremental improvements that like we made instant on a little bit faster. They're, they're really game changers and they allow us, they allow us to study uh, spaces of the landscape, regions of the landscape that were completely inaccessible before. So now let's briefly talk about some insights and applications for our tools. So what can we learn from computing GV invariants? Well, we, as you got a glimpse in the previous plot, the Yawa range in the following way. There's always a sort of like a central cone of potent rays where they have infinitely many GV invariants and they are surrounded by sort of like a bouquet of new potent rays that have only finitely many GV invariants. Uh, and as, as you increase the number of moduli, this cone of potent rays gets really thin and there are many, many, many new potent rays. So the, the non-zero GV invariants actually get exponentially sparse. And if we think about these new potent rays, Turns out that the extremal ones with some conditions like positive GV invariants actually correspond to floppable curves. And, and the, the change in topological data is actually easy to compute just from the GV invariant. This is a, a cartoon of how this kind of thing works. So here we have a potent ray that is new potent ray that is extremal. So we can flop it over here and then it uncovers another new potent rate that is now extremal, so we can again flop it. And we can play these kinds of games to explore non-toric phases. And 
kind of things. Uh, it's very related work that some of my collaborators are working on. And so now with this, uh, with this insight in mind, it now makes sense that there are many, many important ways since Calabria we have many, many phases uh, with increasing number of moduli. There have exponentially many. Here's a picture of a 2D slice of Kaler cones at the at H11 equals 491. So each little colored region is is, <clears throat> is a different color cone. These are a real picture, by the way. Okay, so now let's finally talk about some applications of our tools. You think, Andres, uh, you have five more minutes uh, okay, of perfect. regular time. So now let's talk about some possible applications for tools. So a potential math application would be computing the exact Morricon of the Calabria. So you could conjecture that the Morricon is spanned by the curves with non-zero GV invariance. However, this is actually false because there are some, sometimes there can be cancellations and you can get extreme arrays with vanishing GV invariance. However, you, you might propose the a revised conjecture as follows. That the Morricon is given by the smallest full dimensional cone where the computation is consistent. And so far, this seems to be true, but more work needs to be done. But now let's talk about a phenomenological application, uh, which is constructing a KKLT ADAs with a small cosmological constant. So, in our construction that we presented last year, we made heavy use of GV invariance, as I'll show here in, a, in one of the examples we presented. <clears throat> so what we did is that in the flux superpotential, we made a choice of fluxes so that the perturbative part is exactly zero so that we only get our contributions from instanton, instanton contributions to the flux superpotential. And here, the, these coefficients are actually GV invariance of curves. And it turns out that the hierarchy in the GV invariance, it's what in the end uh, gave us an exponentially small uh, flux well, W now, as you can see here. And also at the end, well, is what it turns out uh, giving, it turns into giving us a, an exponentially small vacuum energy. But a more important use for our advancements in, in, in our GV computation is actually checking our KKLT construction, KKLT ADS construction, because uh, a key, because uh, there are worksheet in central corrections to a Keller potential, and we have to make sure that the series converges. And and our constructions have a very large number of moduli, so and we had to find potent rays so that we can check that along those potent rays, the series of, of instantons uh, converges. So here, if you he see, see here on the right, uh, so, the, so along a potent ray, the contributions from instantons, uh, the contributions of instantons uh, a proportional to this, which is the GV invariant of n times a curve, ta n times a curve, uh, times the exponential of minus n times the volume of the curve. So we have to make sure that along that potent ray, this quantity decreases very quickly so that the series actually converges. And as you can see here on the left, it actually does decrease exponentially quickly, quickly meaning that even though the GB invariance ex increase exponentially, this other factor decreases exponentially faster so that our construction is safe. This kind of uh, check would have been impossible to do with previous tools. Here are some other applications. I'll just flash them because I don't have time to talk, to talk about them. But you can try testing for the weak gravity conjecture. You can check for redundancies in the case database. Uh, you can compute the disturbing brain superpotential. You can explore non toric phases and, if, and infinite flow chains. And probably there are many more applications that we haven't even considered yet. So finally, let me conclude. So we've extended the XKT word procedure and wrote new code to compute GV invariance very efficiently. Our advancements 
really enable us to study Clavio. They are, were completely out of reach for previous software, like the, the central package. We developed these tools because we envision a, a wide variety of applications, and we're starting to explore some of them, but surely there's many, many more things we can do. And so our tools will eventually be integrated into our CY tools package, but currently we don't have a timeline for it. So if you have any ideas and are interested in collaborating, then we should talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a very nice talk. Um, there is time for questions. Uh, you may raise your hand or you may uh, just unmute yourself. Otherwise, may, oh, there's a question by Jim. Hey, Andres, nice talk. Um, I, I liked your, your plot of comparing uh, Clem and Clem plus Kreutzer and you guys. Uh, it looked like they had exponential scaling where you guys had sub-exponential. Do you know, is is there anything in your guys' way of doing all of this that is not polynomial time? Uh, I mean, so. Yeah, this one. Here. I mean, so, so what ends up happening is that the computation only depends on, so basically depends only on the number of points. And here you can, well, here the number of points scales quadratically with X. So the, our computation should probably be quadratic, like the, the scaling. Whereas here, I, I'm not really sure how they do it, but yeah, it's very clearly just exponentially increasing. So, so indeed, it's clearly exponential there, and it looks like you guys are sub-exponential. Is there anything else in the pipeline? So this is just one part of the story of the perturbatively flat flux vacua. Is there any other part of the pipeline that's potentially not polynomial time, or is it is it safe to imagine that PFFVs are really just polynomial time solutions? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't think there's any other part where it could be exponential. Like, really, it's exponential in, in H11, but, but not in, like for a fixed stage one one, it shouldn't be exponential. It should be still like a, a large exponent. Like, I don't know if, if you are, yeah, I mean. Okay, good, so thanks. If you are a large stage one one, it's still a large exponent, but it's still not exponential. <clears throat> uh, any other questions? Let me, uh, Inan Wang, please go ahead. Hi, I just have a question. So do you know if there's any program that could compute the same thing or a similar thing for the club of fourfold? Yeah, we can actually also do that. I just didn't present that here, but we also have that, cap that capability. Uh, you, you, you also have the program for that. Yeah. I've been I working see. on that with Monkey. We can do that. Uh, so the code, is, is it released? Uh, I think it's not, it it's not yet released. Eventually it will be released, but, but oh, not, not yet. We're still working on it. OK, I see. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just have a minor question. You mentioned that you're restricting in the beginning to genus zero about Kumar Bach invariance. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, but that's probably sufficient for all the phenomenological applications that you are looking for, for computing yeah, super potential. Yeah, we haven't thought of any reason for going beyond that. So mm. just haven't worked on it. Okay, but uh, do you think there will be uh, just, it would just be a technical uh, simple step or? Well, I'm not sure. It seems, we'll have to see, it seems complicated. Okay. But, okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, if there's no further questions, uh, we can thank uh, Andres again.